Welcome and good morning if you are joining us live on YouTube. Um, and welcome regardless, whatever time and whatever place you find yourself. We hope that you take this time to encounter God, to open yourself to the Holy Spirit, and to know and remember that all of us share a life together as the body of Christ, wherever and whenever we find ourselves. I also invite you to take a moment now, if you'd like, and uh, to reach out to someone. Um, it could be through the YouTube chat, again, if you're joining us live. Um, it could be a, a Facebook message or a tweet or a text. And just reach out to someone, let them know that you're there, uh, check on them, and in that way we can pass the peace one to another. As we begin our worship service, there are some announcements I'd like to share. You have a chance to join me virtually after worship today on Sunday at 1145. As I said last week, we are going to have a live experience of sharing joys and concerns via Zoom. So it'll be a time to share your happiness, your heartache, your worries, uh, or as always, anything that doesn't fit those categories so well. The link to the Zoom is in the bulletin uh, or in the email that goes out each week. Script cards are back. Orders can once again be placed with Lynn Williams every other week beginning on Monday, August 10th. Lynn's contact information, if you don't have it, can be found in your bulletin. The Wednesday night Zoom event is going to be great pairings. We'll talk about two things that you think go well together and also why. So this is uh, where we're talking about like warm chocolate chip cookies and cold milk, peanut butter and jelly, Abbott and Costello. So start thinking of your pairs and you can join in on Wednesday night. The church will be hosting a free clothing giveaway on Tuesday, August 11th from 6 p.m. until 7.30 p.m. This is a bit different from our other clothing giveaways. We've decided to uh, pre-package all the sorted clothing and to package it according to size and to gender. And so there isn't gonna be any picking through the clothes and choosing exactly what you want. Obviously with COVID, we're not gonna be able to try anything on. Um, it's strictly going to be grab and go and uh, you get what you get. So please spread the word so that anyone who might need this ministry can hear about it. The following Zoom meetings are scheduled for this week. Joys and Concerns, as I said, will meet at 1145 after this live service on Sunday. Our Anti-Racism Book Club continues our discussion at 7 p.m. tonight, Sunday night. Feel free to join if you've read the chapters. Uh, feel free to join if you haven't. Either way, you're welcome. The Parish Life Committee is meeting Tuesday night at 7 p.m. And as I mentioned, the all-church Zoom event is on Wednesday at 7 p.m. And now I invite you to join in our call to worship printed in our bulletins, taken from Joel chapter 28. O children of Zion, be glad and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the later rain as before. The threshing floors shall be full of grain. The vats shall overflow with wine and oil. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I, the Lord, am your God, and there is no other. And my people shall never again be put to shame. Then afterward I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female slaves, in those days, I will pour out my spirit. And now I invite you to join in our opening hymn, To God Be the Glory.
invite you to join in the prayer of confession found in our bulletins. Lord, have mercy on us, a people who kill dreamers. We lock them in prison and gas them in the streets and do all we can to silence their dreams. And yet they still dream. Free us from the fear that drives us away from you. Free us from the fear of our neighbors. Free us from the fear of your dreamers. We now invite you to join in a time of silent prayer together. Hear once again the good news of God's promise. God will pour out the Spirit on all flesh, and all who have the Spirit within them will be made new. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. good social distancing, um, but most of them have masks, which is good, um, and of course we remember to, you know, not, de not get too close to people, wash our hands, all those kinds of things that I'm doing and I hope you are too. Today, I'm going to talk with the grown-ups about dreams. So first, I want you to close your eyes and to try to remember the last dream that you had. We'll give it a moment. I've got mine. So we're thinking about the last dream that we had, and dreams are very different, right? They're different from everyday life, and they're also different from each other. So one night, I might have a happy dream, where I wake up kind of excited or curious. Another night, I could have a bad dream, I could have a nightmare, where I wake up scared. And then most nights, I think I dream, but I don't remember. Or maybe the moment I wake up, I think about the dream, and then it kind of floats away. It's gone. There are also dreams you have during the day. I don't know if any of you, when you thought of the last dream you had, I don't know if you thought of a daydream. But a daydream is when we're awake, but our mind kind of wanders, and we might imagine something different from where we are, or we might tell ourselves a little story, either like, like a storyteller, or like we're in the story and we're imagining going through it. So these are two kinds of dreams, when we're sleeping and when we're awake. And one of the neat things about dreams is that Dreams are one of the ways that God says God can talk to us. Like when God says, this is what it will be like when I am in your life, when I am in the world, God says one of the ways you'll know is that you're going to dream dreams. Both when you're sleeping and when you're awake. And the thing about dreams is that when we're dreaming, the world is different. Like when we're dreaming and we're asleep, sometimes the world is really different. Like one dream I had, I was playing a soccer game in New Zealand. I don't know how I knew it was New Zealand, but I did. And then above me in the sky was a giant oval hole that looked like a lake. 
And then through that lake, like it was underwater, I could see another planet that was hovering near the Earth. It looked like Jupiter. And there was another town on that planet, and I was wondering what they were doing. In another dream I had, I was in the mall that I used to go to when I was a teenager back in Florida, but it was flooded with water and vines had taken over everything, and I was boating around in a canoe in this mall. Like when we dream, the world is different from the way it is now. And so when we dream, this is what I want you to remember. One of the things our dreams tell us is that God wants the world to be different from how it is now. So when we dream, what we can remember is God isn't done changing the world, and God isn't done changing us. Please join me in prayer. Thank you, God, for giving us dreams when we're sleeping and when we are awake to remind us that you are not finished. Amen. Our first reading today comes from Psalm 105. And if you'd like to read along, you can find it in your bulletin. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wonderful works he has done. His miracles and the judgments he has uttered. O offspring of his servant Abraham, children of Jacob, his chosen ones, when he summoned famine against the land and broke every staff of bread, he had sent a man ahead of them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. His feet were hurt with fetters, his neck was put in a collar of iron, until what he had said came to pass, the word of the Lord kept testing him. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the people set him free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his possessions to instruct his officials at his pleasure and to teach his elders wisdom. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Our second reading today comes from the book of Genesis. And if you'd like to follow along, you can find the reading in your bulletin. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, the land of Canaan. This is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his children because he was the son of his old age, and he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he answered, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring back word to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron. He came to Shechem, and a man found him wandering in the fields. The man asked him, What are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. The man said, They have gone away, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels, carrying gum, balm, and resin, on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and not lay our hands on him. For he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for twenty pieces of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in prayer. Holy Spirit, we are one people because you bind us together out of scattered peoples in various times and places you make us one open our ears so that we may hear open our eyes so that we may see open our mouths when it is time to speak amen So today, for the sermon, I'm going to be focusing on this story from Genesis, the story of Joseph being sold into slavery by his brothers. Now, this story is a lot of different things. Uh, one thing it is, is a callback to Ishmael. Remember Ishmael, the first son of Abraham? In this story, we meet the Ishmaelites. God has kept God's promise. And Ishmael is becoming a nation. 
in his own name and his generations proceeding from him. This is also a story about how God can take someone's evil intentions and turn those intentions into good in the end. About how God is playing the long game, so to speak. And when it seems like evil is making initial gains, its defeat, its ultimate defeat is certain. But for me, this story will always be defined by my experience of the Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, Tennessee. So if you're going to go to Memphis, uh, and I have, I have family who have lived there my whole life, if you're going to go to Memphis, I actually recommend Skip Graceland. Uh, it's very overpriced. It's a little bit underwhelming, to be totally honest. Unless you're a huge Elvis fan, then it's probably worthwhile. For everyone else, you can probably save yourself a hundred bucks or so to go. And uh, you definitely want to go to the Memphis Zoo if you're there. If you're going to get barbecue, you want to go to Central Barbecue, either of their locations. They have the best barbecue in Memphis, which in my opinion means the best barbecue, period. In fact, if you're going to, if you're going to go to Memphis, come talk to me. I still have family there. They can show you a good time. It's a wonderful city. But one thing you need to do if you go to Memphis is to go to the Civil Rights Museum. For 15-year-old Doug, the first time I went, it was, I hope, life-changing, certainly mind-changing. The uh, museum is held in the Lorraine Motel in downtown Memphis. And if you haven't heard of that motel before, um, it is the, the location where Martin Luther King Jr. was shot. And so they took the Lorraine Motel. It still looks like a 1960s motel. They haven't changed the outside except to maintain it. And then inside, they have transformed the whole motel into a civil rights museum. And so when you come in, there's like a, there was a big dramatic sculpture there at the time. Um, and you basically go through, you walk along 400 years of history of civil rights struggle in the United States and really in the, the Western Hemisphere. But what I remember most clearly from this experience is when you come to the end of the tour. The tour ends in the motel room where Martin Luther King Jr. was staying. And it's a combination of uh, some uh, artifacts in the museum and some articles. Um, and one of the things that you do is you pass a quote. And the quote that you pass is from this story in Genesis. It pulls out the line, let us kill the dreamer and see what becomes of his dreams. And right after you walk past that quote, you walk out onto the balcony where Martin Luther King Jr. was shot. And then to the left, you climb down the stairs from the balcony out to the parking lot. And that is the end of your tour of the museum. So when I first uh, came to this museum, when I first experienced it, this was striking. Um, obviously, it's meant to be striking. I was struck. And at the time, I think, being about 15 years old, I had thought that Martin Luther King Jr. was unique. He was the only civil rights leader whose name I knew who had been killed, who had been assassinated. At that time, I hadn't heard about Malcolm X or Fred Hampton or Medgar Evers. I hadn't heard about the Tulsa massacre, uh, where a mob of white supremacists murdered hundreds of black people who had built up a section of Tulsa of their own, where they owned businesses and they were being successful and people didn't like that. And so they came in and, and ran through the street shooting people. They flew planes overhead and dropped firebombs into the neighborhood. I had never learned about this. I learned about this from a TV show not that long ago, to be, on, to, to be honest. I had never heard about MOVE in Philadelphia, uh, a black power organization that had run-ins with the police. But the way that MOVE ended is that the, a police helicopter dropped a firebomb onto their house and killed the five or six adults and five children inside. 
And then the fire spread through that neighborhood and burnt down 68 more houses in downtown Philadelphia. This is in like the late 60s. I'd never heard of this. I hadn't heard of the only violent coup to ever occur on United States soil. It is in uh, Wilmington, North Carolina in 1898. It's the late years of Reconstruction, the time period during which at the, uh, at the end of slavery, black people were flourishing. They were getting on city councils, moving into government, opening businesses, and a lot of people didn't like that. And so in, in Wilmington, North Carolina in 1898, a mob of about 2,000 white people went into the town council building, uh, murdered a bunch of the council people, drove them out of the city, and replaced them with white people. As many as 300 people were killed that day, including multiple lynchings, um, the local sheriff was involved, the police, and that is the only violent coup that's ever happened in U.S. soil, was a, the violent overthrow of a local black city council. I hadn't heard about Senator John Stevens or Reverend George Lee or Lamar Smith. For that matter, I hadn't yet learned about Harvey Milk or Marsha Johnson or John Simmons or Oscar Romero or so many other people. There are too many to name. So many dreamers have been killed and so many more have been repressed. And then here we are now in 2020. We're still segregated. Due to the loophole in the 13th Amendment, there are more people living in slavery now, working for no pay through prison labor, than there were at the height of United States slavery. If you're black, you're five times more likely to be in prison than if you're white for the same crime. The black unemployment rate was twice what it was for whites before the coronavirus. That has worsened. I couldn't find solid numbers yet, but it's definitely worse. The average white family has 10 times the wealth of the average black family. If I were to walk through that Civil Rights Museum again, one of the things I would see is 400 years of heartbreaking brutality aimed at dreamers for the purpose of silencing and eradicating their dreams. Dreams and visions are the promise of God's presence. We read about this in our passage from Joel, in our call to worship. God sends dreamers. In our story from Genesis, Joseph's brothers conspire to kill him. They do this for a return to a status quo that had worked well for them. They didn't like that there was this new little brother who was dad's favorite. They didn't like that he, his mother was a different mother. They didn't like probably that he was kind of a tattletale, probably pretty obnoxious. He had appended their system. He had reversed things, thrown their family system into chaos, and they were willing to kill him so that they could return to how it was. When we look at our own history, we, we kill our brothers and our sisters, the dreamers among us, for the same reason. Because they threaten a status quo that is comfortable for us. Because they upend a system for which we, from which we benefit, willingly or not, consciously or not. Or honestly, for those of us probably hearing this sermon and preaching it, we don't necessarily kill dreamers, but we can certainly do nothing when things happen to them. We can even offer ourselves as willing ears, as a willing audience to stories about these dreamers, that they're thugs, they're looters, they lack values and family cohesion. They're lazy. They'd rather live off of welfare than work. That one is a token hire. That one's a diversity hire. And that one got into college 
because of their race. And we let these stories take root and fester and smother dreams. The sad and painful irony is that it is our dreams that can save us. Our dreams are what can save us. They are gifts from God for that purpose. Now, I couldn't resist today. I usually don't use quotes in my sermons, even though I was instructed by some that for a sermon you have three points, and then you read a poem, and then you read a quote, and then that's, you're done. That was a very standard sermon structure. Probably some of you have heard sermons that have a structure similar to that. So I'm going to make up for it today because I have kind of a long quote. But my friend and colleague Hugh Hollowell wrote this week about dreams and how dreams saved him. And I was working on this sermon, and I absolutely could not resist. It's a brief thumbnail sketch of Hugh. I tell people, if you want to see what Christianity looks like in action, look at Hugh Hollowell. And I continue to say that. You can Google it. Um, I can give you a link so you can receive his newsletter weekly. Uh, but this is from his newsletter, and it's about dreams. When I was 17, I joined the Marines. I had never been on an airplane, never been away from home, never seen the ocean, never spent time with people who were different than I was in any significant way. The Marines would change all that for me. But I was scared, in a big way. During boot camp, you are never alone. You even use the bathroom in large rooms with no stalls, huge group showers, bunk beds in large barracks, no solitude at all, no place to cry, no place to think. I would lay in my bed at night alone with my thoughts, exhausted from the day's activities, convinced I was a poser, far from home, and convinced I was going to fail. And the idea of all that scared me to death. It was there that I learned to dream of a better world. As a survival technique, I would play movies in my head about what life would be like when this was over. Boot camp was 13 weeks of hell, after which you got 10 days off at home. In my bunk late at night amid the snores and farts and nightmares, I would play in my head a movie of what I would do for those 10 days. I saw myself in my dress blues visiting the grocery store at which I had worked. I envisioned my girlfriend and I cruising the strip in my hometown on Friday night. I pictured a hamburger from the gas station I had often ate lunch at, with juices dripping down my chin. And the more scared I got, the more vivid my movies became. And I survived. And on those 10 days off, I did all those things and more. I dreamed of a better world as a means of surviving the current one. And then I brought that world into existence. I've used this technique constantly since then. Some 13 years ago, I moved to a new city with $800 and a backpack full of books and a vague idea of what I was going to be. I slept on the floor in a rooming house where I would hear rats scurrying after I turned out the light. I was unsure how I was going to survive. But I would close my eyes and dream of an organization that would change my city. I saw myself on stage giving keynote talks. In the movies I played out in my head, I was respected and I did work that mattered. All of that came to pass. Some years later, I was married and the leader of a grassroots organization that was making an impact, but no money. I was behind on rent and terrified I was going to fail and not be able to provide for my family. I would lay in bed at night, exhausted after a day in the trenches, and dream of owning a house. I played out movies involving me tending to my garden, tending my chickens, sitting in my study lined with books. I played that movie in my head so often I could still see it if I closed my eyes. As I write this, I am in my study, lined with books. I just came in from watching my chickens play in their coop as I walk through my garden. 
My advice to you is to do what I am doing. Dream of what the world, your world, will look like when this is over. Picture the people you will visit, the places you will go. Make it as detailed as possible. Don't just see a picture in your head of you at the beach, but make it a movie. See the sand between your toes. Smell the salt air. Hear the gulls and the wind. Watch your kids build sandcastles. See the tide come in and watch the waves chase the sandpipers on the shore. In his book, Man's Search for Meaning, Holocaust survival, survivor Viktor Frankl said that the people who survived the death camps were, by and large, people who had a reason to survive. They dreamed of what they would do when the war was over and they were liberated. They dreamed of grandchildren yet unborn, of people to see and hold, of experiences they still wanted to have. They dreamed of a better world than the one they were in. And so can you. If Joseph's brothers had succeeded in killing the dreamer, it would have doomed them. And in turn, all of the Hebrew people with them to famine. They didn't know this, of course, but we do because we've read the rest of the story. I can only imagine that it's far worse for us. Collectively, we have killed generations of dreamers. And we have oppressed even more. And I've mostly stuck to one category of dreamer because it was on my mind from the Civil Rights Museum, but we've done similar things and still do the same to Native Americans, refugees and asylum seekers, migrant workers, trans folks. You can name your category of dreamer and then look at the history of how we have worked hard to silence them or worked hard to look away while they were being silenced. Obviously, if Joseph's brothers were offered the straight choice of either living in Canaan without their brother and starving, or moving to Egypt with their brother and thriving, they would make the easy choice. They would have let Joseph go, put up with him being a tattletale and dad's favorite, for the greater good. But that is not how this kind of choice works. Not for them and not for us. The actual choice is and always has been this. Either we love the world as it is now, the status quo and the systems that benefit us, or we hear and honor the dreamers and accept change that will come to that world. Change that will lift up people who have long been held down. Despite all that we have done, God still fills the world with dreamers. The question remains, what will become of their dreams? Amen. I now invite you to join in our next hymn, Help Us to Accept Each Other.
I'd like to just take a moment um, to do the weekly offering reminder. So during this pandemic is a very difficult time to do anything, including to do church. Um, and there are many ways that we've tried to rise to that challenge, and uh, many new challenges have come. But somehow, I have to say, as of right now, this congregation is actually doing pretty well, um, which is amazing. And part of the reason for this is that the staff and volunteers have stepped up, and part of the reason for this is that many of you have given your time and energy as well. And part of the reason for this is that your generosity continues in supporting this church. Uh, obviously, we have less overhead because this building is mostly empty, um, but we still do have bills, and prayers and time and energy don't pay any of those bills. Um, and so thank you for your continued generosity in all the ways that you give that keep this congregation together during an unprecedented time. Now is the time when we come together in prayer with and for one another, sharing our joys and our concerns, and as always, any prayers that don't fit those categories so well. Please join me in prayer. Loving God, we gather before you once again in spirit from many places and many times. We gather in the midst of our celebrations that are happening in our lives. We gather in the midst of grief and anxiety and difficulty. And Lord, we equally lay all of those things before you, knowing that you join us in our rejoicing, and if anything, even more so in our suffering and our difficulty. Today we give thanks for Jen's nephew, Peter Kent Johnson. He'll be leaving to begin his career in the U.S. Navy. We've been asked to pray for Peter's safety, health, and mental well-being while quarantined for 14 days in a hotel room before heading to boot camp. We also take this time to join with Sarah in giving thanks for the fact that she has found a job and she is excited to begin that job in the near future. It's doing something she's good at, something she loves doing. Lord, we also lift up the many people who continue to experience challenges around employment, underemployment, unemployment, interviews, networking, and all the difficulties that people face. We also pray for the teachers, families, and administrators who are currently working hard and struggling and agonizing over decisions about school starting soon and what that school will look like and how to educate and how to be safe. And we pray for Gary and Barb who have entered into quarantine in preparation to go and meet their grandchild. Lord, we lift up all these prayers in the name of your Son, who in turn has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now I invite you to join in our closing hymn, Thankful Hearts and Voices Raise.
Go now in peace. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And love yourselves, your neighbors, and your enemies. Amen.